At the very beginning of the Ukraine war, Elon Musk, whom I know nothing about personally, sent a satellite over Ukraine immediately. And that satellite has enabled to a great deal for the people there to communicate to the outside world. The question I have, where in the world are the thousands of people we hire that work for us in the United States government who doesn't have a scintilla of foresight? <laughs> Number two, same man, Elon Musk. Though he makes his living primarily from electric cars, the green world, has said publicly that it makes no sense when the United States can have independence and be more than self-sufficiency in the oil and gas, and yet we let Russia take over that market, which is a precursor probably of the war in which we find ourselves, he said, who is a proponent of the electric car, America must get back into the oil and gas business. You say, well, I didn't come to church for politics, but you came to church for morality, and that's exactly what I'm speaking to at this moment. And while I'm talking about the public sector, I've waited almost a month. We had a funeral on our West Campus for a constable who was killed. The family was there, and we were trying to honor the Lord Jesus Christ and this man. And our county judge, Hidalgo, showed up. and. At the wrong time, she began to shake hands with the family and more or less began to walk around. And they went to her and said, Judge, we have a place for you to sit down. We have a procedure here we do in this worship service of honor. And she said, I'm paraphrasing, but it's close to exactly what she said. I am the judge of this county, and I can, in other words, go and say and do what I want to do. Let me tell you something, folks. We didn't elect people in any form of office, and we've had presidents in the United States in our worship services. We've had vice presidents in our worship services. We've had governors and mayors in all walks of life. And I will say to any and everybody, this is God's property, this is God's house, and we'll conduct worship the way we want to, and that will be where we'll stand. We don't elect kings or dictators or potentates or emperors or prime ministers. We elect people who put their hand upon, I pray, the Bible and swear before God and the watching world they'll uphold the Constitution of the United States and be the servants of all of us. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful there are some servant leaders out there that understand leadership does not come with a position or an appointment, but it comes with a great deal of humility, saying, Lord, I'm unable, I'm ill-equipped, I don't have all it takes, but I pray for your wisdom and your guidance in order to humbly serve the people who elected me to this position. 
Lord, forgive all of us when we have put self and selfishness ahead of kingdom purposes. Right now, I pray, will you speak and let me get out of the way? Is our petition in Jesus' name. Amen. We could offer after this service 25 or 30 classes in which you and I could attend on all sorts of subjects, biblical subjects, 25 or 30 classes. And in one of those classes, we would entitle it, How to Know the Will of God. I guarantee you that class would fill up for any of the other classes that we'd offer. Have you ever watched a road lizard? Not much. A road lizard, they just squirm around seemingly without rhyme or reason. They get in the highway, the roads, and, and they're capricious, and you don't know if they're looking for food or they run right into trouble. They're just and I use the phrase crazy as a road lizard. You know what I'm talking about? Sure you do. A lot of us seek the mind and the will of God like a road lizard. And I've been guilty of this, and maybe you have. We have a decision to make. We want to let God get in on it, and hopefully we're a part of what he's leading us to do. And we flip a coin and say, well, heads, I'll do this, tails, I'll do this. Road lizard methodology of seeking God's will and plan. Or we look for the magic Bible verse. Lord, I don't know what to do. Please give me insight. Bang, that's it. Oh, yes, you spoke to me. Or we make lists of pro and con on that decision. And the longest list, that's how we go, forgetting that the priorities on the list should be the thing that most gives us insight. Road lizard methodology of trying to find the will of God. And sometimes we say, well, there's a biblical principle there in Judges 6. I put a fleece out. Remember, it's wet tomorrow and it's dry today. Listen, that method is not available to us at this moment in time. That was one situation there with Joshua, period. Road lizard methodology of finding to find the will of God. And we see it all over the place, and some of us fall back into that trap. Now, if you are in Christ and I am in Christ, the Bible tells us, and we know because we're seeking the leadership of the Holy Spirit, some basic principles of discovering the will of God. And because God loves us, and if we're in Christ, does it seem strange to anybody here that God is putting his plan and purpose for your life and my life in some mysterious hidden way? Does that sound like a God who loves us? We know that when we're living and acting according to his plan in this world, in this universe for you and for me, and you think he's, I don't want them to find out. Oh, I sure hope they don't find out. And finding the will of God for some is like an Easter egg hunt. We do that every year with our grandkids. We hide eggs all over the place, and, and they want to find the golden egg. And as they're looking, we'll say, you're getting hotter. Or you're getting colder. Does God operate like that? Well, you're getting close to knowing what I want you to do, but I'm telling you, you oh, no, you're getting cold. Does you think Almighty God is operating like that and trying to give instruction, insight, and his wisdom in the decision-making process of your life and my life. We've been studying Romans chapter number 8, and we're going to be there for a while yet. And we've already ran into there the 26th verse last week. If you missed it, you missed one of the pivotal verses in the Bible. Remember, it says the Holy Spirit, when we're praying, helps us. Remember the word helps? Big old long Greek word, soon ani lambanotai, remember it? And what does it mean? It means that so many times we do not know how to pray, and we say something, we're seeking God's mind, God's will for healing, for, for guidance, and whatever the situation might be, and 
that verse gives us assurance that the Holy Spirit helps, goes over where we are, we don't know exactly how to pray, and takes hold of us, soon means with, Annie on the other side, Lombano tie, takes hold of you and me as we're trying to pray and prays on our behalf. And write down this principle, I said it last week, I could say it a thousand times, a thousand times. This is the basic principle. The Holy Spirit helps you and I to pray as you and I would pray if we knew what God knows. Stay with that. Don't say, I got it. No, stay with it. So we pray, and our prayers go up to the Lord, and sometimes we pray in ignorance and stupidity, even though we're sincere. But the good news is we cannot mispray. And then we come to the verse, just the part of the verse we're looking at today that deals with God's will. Hope you have your Bibles with you. Open them if you would, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. We looked at it last week. Let me restate it. In the same way, the Spirit helps. There's our big old word, goes over where we are, takes hold of our problem, and prays on our behalf. The Holy Spirit helps. The Holy Spirit helps, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You follow me? Then verse 27, and he who searches the hearts, who searches our hearts? Jesus. Jesus searches our hearts. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, Jesus knows the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit primarily, remember, is honoring Jesus. Because he intercedes, Jesus, for the saints, according to, there's our phrase, will of God. Don't get lost in that. It's saying God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is involved in all of our prayers, and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit is involved in helping you and I to know what God wants us to do and decide and how we are to live in that particular unique situation that's unique to every single one of us. By the way, I didn't say most unique. That's terrible English. Anything you put ahead of unique is terrible English. Unique means one of a kind, right? That's it. So we see here that when we pray, Jesus searches our hearts because Jesus knows the mind of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit takes our verbiage we're offering to God and it goes again through Jesus as our intersector at the right hand of the Father and out of this comes the will of God. Reveal to you, reveal to me. Now, let me bring it down a little bit and talk about the will of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God. First of all, the will of God is hidden. There is a hidden will of God. And if you're a theologian, that is under the sovereignty of God. In other words, you say, boy, my life, I heard people say, my life is all messed up. I made a wrong decision when I got married, and I should have done this, and I should have done that. I should have stayed, and I moved, and the grass looked greener on the other side. By the way, folks, let me tell you about something about green grass. You see cows through the barbed wire fence eating grass over there because they think the grass over there is greener than the grass where he's pastured? Have you ever seen that? Sure you have. What is that cow saying? Boy, I wish I could get through that barbed wire fence and get to all that green grass. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Every field has beggar lice, cuckaburs, and blighted spots in it. I don't care what side of the barbed wire fence you're on. There ain't no green grass. There ain't no green grass. And therefore, sometimes we're seeking God's will, and we realize it is hidden to us. And the hidden part of God's will is a super thing because you and I, follow me, most of the time know that we're in God's will only as we look in the rearview mirror. 
we look back in the rearview mirror and we say, you know, I didn't know God was there and God led me here and I moved over there. I had no idea what was going on. That's true of every single one of us with a little introspection, with a little backward glance. And I like the, the thing that I learned from Leslie Weatherhead. There is God's intentional will, follow me, what God intended for you and me to do in every decision in our life. But we don't always do that. We mess up. We're not perfect, big news. We're not perfect, big news. Therefore, God's intentional will may be for this, but we made some wrong choices, and therefore, now we operate in his circumstantial will, right? But in that circumstantial will, guess what? His ultimate will will be carried out. Somebody said, well, I made a mistake and there's no hope. No, God in Jesus Christ specializes in second chances, third chances as we go through. So his intentional will will be carried out in our life as we walk and live in Jesus Christ. But there is the hidden will of God. And then there is the general will of God. By the way, somebody looking for God's will, do you climb a tree and look to heaven and try to conjure up some emotional feelings or some sign or symbol to find out his will? We look for his will, guess where the first place to look? God's will is found in his word. It's, it's right there for us. Psalm 19 says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet tells us how to walk right now. And a light unto our path tells us how to walk in the future. So let's start with God's Word. Does that seem strange to anybody or peculiar to anybody? No, it's where we start when we determine every choice, every decision we make in life. I'm not talking about whether you go to Safeway or Kroger, by the way. Don't get ridiculous and silly. I see some super pious, whining, whining people that drop back into that. Don't get me there. But I'm saying about decisions we make in life. Let's start with the five basic things, five things we need to operate in our life that the Bible tells us is the will of God for every single person on the planet. Okay? Let's start there. That is the general will of God for everybody. Look at it. It is that we be saved. John 6, 40, I wish I could go and exegete all these passages, but we want to get home before dark. It is we be saved, and I use the word so many times, salvage, restored through faith in Jesus Christ for our repentance and receiving him. We are saved, we are saved, we're salvaged. Number two, be filled with the Spirit. When we come to Christ, the Spirit comes in our life, but we leak, so there's a constant thing of saying, Lord, I want to be available for your filling, Ephesians 5. And then we go down the next thing up there. Be sanctified, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. And basically said, that means we are growing up and becoming increasingly pure. Anybody like the word pure? That's, that's a part of growing up in Christ. We get pure, our motives get right, our, our background is, we, that's being sanctified, that's growing up in our faith. The next thing is the will of God, we be serving. We serve. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a function and an office for everybody here, no matter what your state of life, where you are, sick, well, doesn't matter, we have something everybody here can do. Ministries of prayer, ministries of service, ministries, I mean, it's, it goes out into almost infinity. We all have certain gifts, put them to work. They can be holding the door, they can be cutting. It's a zillion things out there. Just stand up, look around, find a place where you can serve. Now, we have people all the time who come and says, I want to sing a solo. Well, we'll try you out if you can sing, but if you can't, guess what? That's not your gift. And I don't decide that. God decides that by the affirmation of our gifts. So find a place you can serve, whatever it is. We are, if we are seeking the will of God, we have to be using, we have to be serving. Next thing is, look, be suffering. Oh, my goodness, you mean the will of God? I know I only got to be saved, got to be pure and sanctified. And on top of that, goodness, I've got, now I've got to suffer. 
Yes, let me tell you about that suffering. There's a painting called The Straight and the Narrow. Remember Jesus said there's a narrow way that leads to heaven, there's a broad way that leads to hell. There's a painting, famous painting, and it pictures a mountain and there's a few people on that mountain struggling, climbing, trying to reach the city of God. Oh, they're having a tough time. Then the same picture, there's a river that's flowing and there are people all in that river having a great time and the river is flowing, but you can see in the foreground, those who are in the broad way, they're about to go over a cliff and to destruction and be killed down on the rocks below, but they're just having a big time. This group is climbing that mountain and struggling. You say, boy, that's a good picture. No, it's not. No, it's not. But as Christians, it's not that we're lonely, climbing up a mountain, trying to get to the city of God. But as Christians, here is the broad way where everybody's in that river, but we're in the river. The only difference is we're swimming upstream. And when you swim upstream, you bump into people, and you'll be sure if you walk with Jesus Christ in the 21st century, there's going to be some suffering. There's going to be some suffering. So that's the picture. So here there are five things not operating perfectly in our life that we're committed to, we understand. That's the will of God. That's not too complicated, is it? I mean, there they are. What's God's will for my life? For my, oh, no. Start off with those five. And those five begin to catch fire as the Holy Spirit permeates them. Look at these concentric, concentric circles that we have here. You have the Spirit. And the Spirit is basically the givenness of life, in my definition. In other words, that's, that's our instincts, that's our unique personalities, that's that little Spirit in you and in me. And then there's the soul, and that's where we make decisions, that's where we move out, that's where we act upon things. And then there's the body, obviously what it is. Now, I believe the Spirit and the soul are interchangeably in the Bible, there are other theologians that disagree with that. In other words, we're made in the image of God, and that is his spirit, and the soul comes out as we respond to how we're led by the spirit. But when we come to Christ, the whole person is redeemed, and the Holy Spirit comes almost like a candle that comes in our life. And as we begin to grow and understand that candle is lighted, we come to Christ and that lighted candle, the Holy Spirit needs to go and deal with the givenness of your life, the bottom of our life, the beginning of our life, and it moves out into our soul and it moves out into our body until suddenly we see the whole person of you and me is spirit filled. That's growing up in Jesus Christ. That's the way to illustrate it. And then we move into the wisdom area of determining the will of God. If these five things are operating and we're growing and the Holy Spirit is leading in your life and in my life, guess what the will of God is in any situation? Trust the Lord with all your heart, five things. Lean not upon your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, the operative principle of these five things, and guess what? He will direct your life. And then it becomes any decision, master, Lord Jesus Christ, mission, your calling, your vocation, your mate, your mate. And I see this so many times, people. It's like that girl that was dating six guys named William. You know what she was? A bill collector, a bill collector. <laughs> So a lot of times, I don't know where to marry this one or to marry this one or to go there. Let me tell you something. When the Holy Spirit is all in our life, all of a sudden the wisdom of God comes in our life, and then we begin to go back. Now, we've got the general will, haven't we, for everybody? Now let's get person. Well, you didn't tell me whether or not I should move or whether or not I should build a house or rent or whether not, and all the other. Let me tell you how that works. Matthew chapter 7, what does Jesus say that we do? He says simply, ask, you'll receive. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it'll be open to you. That's in our praying we ask. 
We say, Lord, I know the blank check is there. I know I can lead, but I want to ask you for your leadership and guidance. And when making a big time decision, take a time out, sit down, listen to God, listen to God, ask God, and wait. And then you seek. What does that mean? You seek information. You go to godly people. You get advice and counsel. And that's when you might make those lists. And you're seeking information about it. And then finally, you knock, and a door may open, the door may close. By the way, just because there's an open door doesn't mean we walk in it. That's God's will. Well, this door opened for me. I was in seminary. I had a professor, Virgil Marfield, my first semester. He taught me homiletics. That's preaching. You could tell he failed in his task. But anyway, he taught me homiletics. And he was a young man, and after class one day, we had a large class, and he came to me, he said, you know, I, I've watched you, and I think maybe you ought to go with my family and I, because this is the last semester I'm going to teach in seminary. We're going to Italy as a missionary. And I'd love for you to learn Italian with our family and go with us. I think you'd really be effective. Whew. Man, that's floored me. And I remember what my dad said when I told him I was called by God to work in the church, which was weird to all of my family. I can assure you of that. And my dad said, you're throwing your life away. Nobody's lazier than preachers. My dad believed that. And now, after a while in this ministry, I almost agree with him too. But anyway, he said, look. And then he said, of all things, my mom said, don't go to one of those foreign mission fields. Now, here I was thinking the will of God was something that I didn't know. By the way, the will of God isn't, the most, isn't always the most difficult thing to do. Oh, it must be the will of God because I've got to sacrifice it. No, 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 no. An open door doesn't mean an opportunity. A closed door doesn't mean an opportunity because we have these things operative in our life, and God gives us wisdom to make decisions. And I waited until I finished seminary. I felt no leadership, but I was willing. I was ready. I'll go to Bangladesh today if I get a clear indication. It wouldn't be a skinny minute like that. So at the bottom line is the will of God, when these things are operating in your life, in my life, he gives us his wisdom, and we're getting to make good choices because now, remember our verse, the Holy Spirit has picked us up, and when we pray and seek information, the Holy Spirit takes the right prayer to Jesus Christ at the right hand of God, and he interprets the Father and that kind of praying is answered every single time. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes it is yes. Sometimes it is maybe. Sometimes it is wait. But it's always answered. This is how we know the will of God. The Holy Spirit picks us up.